were made to glorify God, and that's what we're going to do together this morning. This first song talks about God's love for us. As Martin Luther says, God doesn't love us because we are of worth. We are of worth because God loves us. Let's stand together and sing this song together. Uh, 
this morning we're grateful to have a guest speaker with us and his wife. Uh, we have Bob Weeks and his wife Kathy with us this morning. Bob is the team leader for church and leader development, evangelism, and prayer for our state convention. Uh, and he's going to be bring a, bringing us a message in just a few moments. And so we are grateful uh, to have him and his wife with us this morning. As we get ready to continue in worship, uh, let's turn our attention for just a moment to the Lord. Uh, and go to him in prayer together. Will you pray with me? God, we are grateful to be here together today. We thank you for your goodness, for your kindness, for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you for a place to come together and worship you today. God, this morning, as many of us have big things going on in our lives, things that uh, if we're not careful, we can allow it to be a distraction to us for what you want to tell us today. Lord, let that not be the case. Help us to turn our attention. Help us to turn our gaze to you uh, this morning to hear a good word from you uh, that we may apply our lives to it today in a way that glorifies you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue worshiping the Lord today. God is our refuge and strength and a very present helps in trouble. and strength, one that we can count on through every trial and through every trouble, we can trust in Him. Let's sing the song. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that You are my fortress, You are my portion, You are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe that through every past, through every promise, You are 
fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the light I believe you are the way the truth
You've got to build your life on something that will last. We want to build our life on a relationship with Jesus. And this song that we're going to sing to close things up is just kind of a declaration at the end that says, Lord, you are my foundation. I'm building my life on you, and nothing will shake me. Nothing will shake me. I'm trusting in you. I'm relying on you. We need to hear that. We're going to sing that song together. He is worthy to build our lives on. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Jesus, name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever say. Worthy of every breath. We could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and
the praise we can ever bring. Worthy of every breath we can ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. We live for you. We live for you. Let's all pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be part of you. We recognize that's all because of your work, not ours. And I'm so grateful, God, because I, I know myself and I know I wouldn't work hard enough. I know that I am not capable of fixing my, my wrongs, my errors, those things of which I have turned left when you said turn right. So I'm just grateful. And God, I, I pray that this morning as we look into your word, that we might be transformed by it. So yes, Lord, please, use the power of the Holy Spirit to unlock your word in our lives, to turn us more into the likeness of Jesus Christ himself. And may that be the constant goal of my life, of our life, that we might be like Jesus. As, oh God, our world needs to see Jesus today. I thank you for the opportunity we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, team. Good job back there. When I played football, we had this stuff called stick em. You would put on your hands. I don't know if you, any of you old-timers know that stuff. The stick em. The sax player needs some stick em, I think. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. That's funny. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, uh, good morning, Northwoods. Good morning. It, it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, in fact, in, in so many ways, stealing from the passage this morning, it's a double honor to be here because I've been here before and got asked back. So I, I think that's a, that's a positive thing in my life to be able to stand before you guys. Um, I see some of you wearing masks, and I want you to know that is perfectly okay to wear a mask. It's also uh, okay not to. Uh, if you, I, I did discover good news about uh, wearing a mask. I had shaved off my facial hair, and uh, when I wore a mask, nobody would make fun of me um, because I didn't have a mustache or a goatee or anything else on my face. So uh, when I take it off, it, I, I do have that kind of, my wife doesn't like it, to be honest with you. So I'm working on maybe growing it back. We'll, we'll see what, what happens with that. Um, this morning, we're going we're gonna to race into the Scripture. We're going to open up to, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, picking up, obviously, right where your pastor Bobby left off um, uh, last week. And I, I think it's, it's pretty interesting to me. Um, I, I get, when I get invited to speak at churches, and, and uh, we, there are... 450 some churches around our state and I, I, I pretty much am in a different, uh, with a different body of believers almost every week um, oftentimes the, the, the pastor will just say to me preach anything you want um, and, and, and which is okay you know I don't, I don't dislike that but I love it when a pastor will say to me I'm, I'm teaching through the book of well 2 Timothy this letter um, you can you can either pick up with what I'm doing or you can preach whatever you want. And, and so to me, it is a tremendous honor to step into the cycle that, uh, that your pastors are doing through 2 Timothy. And um, I, I really do think it's amazing because as I look at this particular passage, I, would, I have never preached this passage before the churches that I served because I didn't want them to take it wrongly. So I think it's interesting that I get to declare this truth to you uh, while your pastor is not here. Um, so I, I, I mean, I just think, I think it's valuable for all of us to really hear this, to wrestle with it, and, and understand what it is. So I probably don't have to deal much with context because we're in the fifth chapter, and so this has been going on for a while now, but I, I'd like to just kind of have you think about this for just a second. When I became pastor at First Baptist Church in North Vernon, Indiana, 
Um, I, I served there for 15 years, but my, when I first got there, I replaced a guy that had been there for 13 years. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is really going to be hard because this guy has, he's developed all of his, his teams, he has trained all of his people, everything is functioning just as he wanted it to be functioning. And I, I, it's going to be hard as a new guy to be able to come in. Well, I just want you to think for a second. Who founded the church in Ephesus? The Apostle Paul. Who was the first pastor of the church in Ephesus? The Apostle Paul. Now, who saw all of these people come to Jesus? The Apostle Paul. I mean, when you start to think about it, Paul has trained them. Paul has reared them. They are all, in so many ways, Paul's children in the faith. Paul leaves, and if you go into Acts chapter 20, you can see that separation that Paul has as he is saying goodbye to the elders of that church. And he, he says before them, he said, I, I, I am not guilty of any man's blood because I have been faithful to proclaim to you the fullness of the gospel from house to house and everywhere that I went. And, and he weeps as he says goodbye and they weep as they say goodbye and they're so sorry to see Paul come and then in walks Timothy. Timothy is young, inexperienced. He is everything that Paul was not. And so can, can you, can you kind of hear it? Paul didn't do it that way. Why? We, we've never done it that way here before, Timothy. That's not the way it's done. Um, those are the kinds of things that you hear. I know. I heard them in the beginning of my, my time at First Baptist North Vernon. It's just not done that way. As Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, we recognize there have been issues going on in the church. And there are issues that Paul honestly hasn't prepared Timothy to face, or he wouldn't have written it down in a letter and sent it to him. And so this is some catch-up stuff going on. This is that kind of stuff like, oh, by the way, Timothy, I probably should have told you whatever this is going to be. So when you look at the context, kind of recognize that this particular passage we're going to look at, as we look at 17 through 25 or 6, I forget which one it is, 25, uh, we will see Paul talk about some specifics of things that are going on, things that you need to make sure you pay attention to, Paul is going to talk about uh, some other things that are, Timothy, this is just for you. Here, they're very personal because Paul loved Timothy. And, and so we have to be discerning to be able to, to see those differences. Let's, let's look at this together for a moment. And let's look starting at the 17th verse. And we're going to, um, what, I, I'm not sure how uh, pastors are doing it here. What I'm going to do is just read a couple of verses, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, and then we'll go back through and look at it. You have uh, the PowerPoint notes in the back of your program, bulletin, whatever you call that, and, and I'm also aware that, that the screen behind me will turn into uh, some PowerPoint things to be able to help us uh, to keep up to. Verse 17 of chapter 5, 1 Timothy says this, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. As I began to consider, what do I title a message coming out of this particular passage? What, what I decided to do was to, to, to say, it, you know, there are just some obvious things that pop out of this passage to me, and they, I think they should be obvious to all people. But then I recognized, as I thought about this, I, so I, I, I entitled it, Things That Should Be Obvious, and, and then I said to myself, wait a second, I could have titled any message I have ever done in my entire life this exact same thing. Because honestly, I kind of feel like I'm, I, that the role of a, of a preacher at times is just to say, look, do you see what this says? And when people nod their heads, I go, yep, that's exactly right. That is what it says. We can go on. But there are some things that should be obvious, but I recognize that for people, not everything is obvious. I was reading in, a, um, in an article uh, online not too long ago about this guy that went to a, um, a gun shop 
in Texas and attempted to rob it with a knife. <laughs> Should have been obvious that wasn't going to work out well. I also was reading about these couple of guys in Texas. I mean, this is kind of sad. They died because they were drinking hand sanitizer. It should have been obvious you don't drink hand sanitizer or Tide Pods. You mean any of those kinds of things. But, but somehow things just sometimes just kind of go, oh, that, that's not going to impact me. And, and even our, our road commission, uh, there is a sign outside of Paoli, Indiana on, on Indiana 56. And the, and the sign says, Hill Blocks View. Hill blocks view. And every time I go by the sign, I go, duh. I mean, it's a hill. I mean, I have yet to see a hill I can see through. So it should be obvious, but apparently it was not because they decided to put a sign there. So as we look at this passage, I, I just want to point out the obvious stuff. And, and for some of us, we're going to go, yeah, duh. That's exactly what it says. But sometimes we need to be reminded. As Paul begins this in, in the 17th verse, he says, Let elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So what do you think is going on in the church that, that Paul is telling Timothy that, that, that elders should be should be recompensed correctly for the work that they're doing. I, I'm thinking that the church has grown some, that the church is now taking and moving on to, to, to having more guys on staff, and those guys that are on staff are now needing to be having so much of their time being spent that they're now going to be full time. And Paul says, if they're leading well, if they're ruling well, they should be considered worthy of double honor. I, I think it should be obvious. A pastor that is doing a good job should be well, well paid. I mean, it's as simple as that. And you'll say, well, Bob, that's obvious. It wasn't obvious in my first church. I, I, I went uh, right out of seminary. In fact, I was still in seminary. Um, you you got to, uh, my story is a little bit different. I'm 42 years old at my first church, however. Uh, didn't get saved till I was 36. Went to seminary on my 40th birthday. I left our home in Michigan to go do that. So uh, my journey is a little bit different. I go to my first church. Um, we have two children. And when, when my children were in school, they, they were already old enough to, to be in the elementary school, they qualified for free and reduced lunches because of my salary. Now, and, and you, and I don't think that this church didn't love me or love us. In fact, they did. I, I'm still very close with all of those people. But do you know what concerns me? It's the testimony that a church has when they choose not to keep their pastors well paid. You see, every time my kids went through the lunch line, the people at the school would be able to say, you know, that they're, they're the kids of the pastor at First Baptist Church. And apparently the church isn't doing well enough to pay them enough that the kids don't have to be getting free lunches. It's a testimony of the church. And, and sometimes we, we lose track that, that our pastors function in the world as people. And when they go into the doctor's office, they need to be able to pay their bills. Because that, that ineffective ability to pay what they owe or be able to do the things that they need to be able to do reflects back on this body of believers, which reflects back on Jesus Christ himself. Must not be much of a God if he can't take care of the people that are serving the people that love him. So I, I, I do want you to know, I am not standing here because I think, I think your pastor or any of them need more money. I don't have a clue. 
honestly what what our pastors here uh, make I just want to make sure that you understand that, that why Paul is writing this and why it's important for us to process it and make sure we keep it straight sometimes I you know I do think that that the church that I served first they were they were looking for a bargain that's why they were calling a pastor that, that was, was in seminary still. They were, they were looking to be able to use those dollars for other things. But I think it looked bad on them. And in fact, it is one of the main reasons why I left that church. I showed up at that little church believing I would be there until I died. That, that, that was, that's always been my intention. Any position that God has allowed me to walk into, it has been, I will be there forever. But it became apparent that we had another child while we were there. And as I began to look forward to my kids going to college and being teenagers, and oh my goodness, teenagers are expensive. Yeah, I see moms looking at kids, and I get it. You know, teenagers are expensive. And, I, and, and so when an opportunity came up, it was like, maybe I should look at this. I would not have looked. I would not have looked if we had been if we were being taken care of. So I just want to make sure that you grab that. So, so when we see that in, the seven, in verses 17 and 18, Paul backs that up, obviously, from Scripture. As, as he says in the 18th verse, um, he, he says, uh, you shall not uh, muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. I mean, this Old Testament passage that this is coming from is, is basically saying when you're reaping your field, you know, the, the, the ox is going to eat. Do you know when an ox eats? whenever he wants to unless you muzzle him and what they're saying look if scripture is saying let the ox feed as he is bringing in your food then Paul is backing that up by saying then, then pay your pastor well because he's feeding you he's feeding you spiritual nourishment every time you gather now, and, and then the, the next part of that comes from words from Jesus himself in that 18th verse. And he says, and the laborer deserves his wages. I think we can just set that right there. The second thing that I think is obvious in this, in this passage in verse 19, if we read this together, it says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And, and, and I, I look at this, it is backed right up to make sure if the elders are doing a good job, especially those that are preaching and teaching, make sure they are well rewarded for what they do. And, and then it's almost like a but that comes in here because Paul is, is in, in his line of thinking runs through and says, Now listen, don't admit an art a charge. Don't listen to a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And I, I think the key word here, I, I think, is evidence. Evidence. Evidence is proof. Evidence is proof that something is going on. And Paul says, just don't, don't listen to evidence by one person, but there have to be two or three people that are presenting this coming out of my experience uh, serving as a pastor for 20 plus years, it, it's, it, there, there were people that obviously didn't like me, which was okay because I didn't like them either. I, well, hey, I mean, the scripture tells me I have to love them, but it, it doesn't say anywhere I have to like them. I mean, love is a much deeper thing and it calls us to action. Like is this kind of fluffy stuff. And so I, it was obvious they didn't like me. I don't think they, I, I, don't, I'm, I'm, I don't think they were lost. I don't, I don't think that they were trying to destroy the church or anything like that. But there were people that were just constant complainers. And, and they would never complain to me. They would always complain to their elder, to their deacon. They would complain to somebody else who would in turn come to me. And early in my ministry, I, I spent so much time dealing with things that if I had just paid closer attention to Scripture, I wouldn't have dealt with it. Because what's the obvious thing in this passage? The obvious thing is that it should be obvious that a pastor shouldn't be reprimanded. A pastor shouldn't be um, confronted based on rumors or pet peeves. Every one of us is intelligent Every one of us has a way that we like to see things happen. But in the church of Jesus Christ, 
We are called to work together, thinking not higher of ourselves than we ought. That we are called to think what is best for the body. And we put over us, we choose to do this, to put pastors and elders in places to be able to guide, direct, pastor, or excuse me, Paul uses the rule word to, um, to not force things on us, but, but do what's best for us. That's how God formulated his church. That's how it works. And so it, it just, Timothy, don't, don't worry about what those folks are saying. Don't worry that they're saying, I did it better than you did. Don't worry about those ones that say, Timothy, you, 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 you just aren't handling this correctly. Don't worry about it. Unless there are some witnesses. Unless you've got evidence. Because Paul immediately then goes to the next thing in, in verse 20. When he says, he says, as for those who persist in sin. Now, the those here is still referring to elders, by the way. I mean, that's the connection back up. We haven't changed this topic that Paul is talking about. And he says, as for those elders who persist in sin. Here's, here's the thing. Uh, well, let's read the whole, whole passage um, together, the whole verse. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Okay, here, here's the thing. We have in, in verse 18, or verse 19, I'm sorry, um, we, we have this thing of, oh, okay, Paul, don't, don't rebuke anybody based on no evidence or just the complaints of one person. Don't, don't, don't do it. However, there will be some times that an elder is absolutely wrong, that there is evidence, there are multiplicity of witnesses, and he must be rebuked. Now, now, now what, what, he, what he says is that if that has happened, then, then other things have already occurred, and we call it discipline. You know what discipline is, right? And it's not beating your children, so just don't, don't say that. Discipline is a process to restore someone to right behavior. It's a process that has a positive outcome, not a negative outcome. It comes from the root word for disciple. And so we, we have this process that has been established, and this elder that we'll, we'll say has done something wrong has gone through the process, but he, he continues, according to verse 20, he, as for those who persist in sin, he refuses to walk in the walk of discipleship, to move toward improvement. He continues to sin. Now, maybe it's because uh, he just feels like, I don't, I'm... I'm better than everybody else. I'm, I'm the pastor. I can do what I want. I mean, I, I don't know how many you're aware of, but because I deal with so many churches around our state, there's always a pastor that is doing something where this passage needs to be, needs to be acted upon. Sometimes it's, it, it involves money. Sometimes it involves improper relationships with, with people that are not their spouses. Um, there, there, there are things that happen of which we have to know how to act. And so what, what does Paul say to Timothy? He says, Tim, what you need to do is for those, those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. In other words, it, it, it should be obvious that the pastor who refuses to accept discipline should be rebuked in the church by the church. Now, please hear me. This is a very public thing that Paul is talking about here. This isn't where somebody stands up and accuses a pastor at the end of a service. I have heard of that happening. But it's just here, you did it. No, no, this is the process has been walked through completely. And this is like the last step of the process. Paul says there's two reasons for this, right? It's obviously to rebuke the guy that has done wrongly, but the rest of it is to make, make sure every single one of us recognize that if the church is willing to do that, to rebuke a pastor in front of us, then they will be willing to rebuke us also. Church discipline has a bad kind of feel to it. 
But, but I, do you know families where there's no discipline in that family? How do you like having those children come over to your house? All right, it's horrible. I mean, we're the family of God. And sometimes we act like we're not called to discipline each other. And, and please remember, discipline, the, the object of discipline is to improve behavior. It, it is a positive outcome thing, not a negative outcome thing. But, but we've kind of grown in that place where, you know, we, we, we're, we're thinking, you know, Grandma's going to get the switch or the yardstick and Dad's getting his belt or, you know, those kinds. Of, this is not like that. This is simply, brother, you're wrong in the way you're acting. And we need to work on that together. And so, so this idea is, is that, that Paul says that, it, that if others will witness this, when they see, in verse 21, verse 20, that that when they see this rebuking happen, um, then the rest of us will stand in awe. Fear is the word that's used here. Stand in awe that we're held accountable for how we live our lives. And guess what? You only think you're not held accountable for how you live your life. But you, you are held perfectly accountable. Every word you've ever spoken, every action you've ever done, anything that you have ever uh, performed in your life, you will be held accountable in the end days for that very thing. You won't, you won't skip accountability. And your brothers and sisters in the church are blessing you by helping you be held accountable now, not later. So as, as Paul goes through that, verse 21 is a very interesting kind of uh, switch uh, in the way Paul is addressing uh, his son in the faith, Timothy. Um, because Paul now switches to this, this holy charge to him, this, this um, laying out of Timothy. Well, let's just read it together. Verse 21, uh, it says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels. I mean, just think about that for a second. As Paul begins to speak this, uh, Pastor Darren said earlier uh, to Ryan, he said, you, use your big preacher voice uh, when you say something. And so the big preacher voice of this might sound like, I charge you. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I mean, this is, this is a very holy charge. But what does he charge him to do? He says, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. What rules is he talking about? I believe he is talking about Scripture itself. It's not just these, these couple of sentences that he has used here. Why do you think Timothy needs to be reminded? Timothy! Do the stuff you read. <laughs> I think it's because I need to be reminded of that. Because we're human. Do you need to be reminded of that? You see, some of us are really good at certain things, and some of us fail at others all the time. And, and we need to be reminded, do Scripture. Do it. It's living Christianity, not attending a service. It's being the church, not coming to church. It's all of those things that we hear about. And, and Timothy is being reminded of that very thing. Paul says, I charge you, Timothy. Pay attention to these and do them. And, and as he says this, he says, keep these. And, and I, I think it should be obvious, one of those obvious things I don't want to miss. Uh, we must do what the Scriptures tell us to do. I mean, right? That's obvious. And so it's obvious uh, we should be people of the Word. It's obvious we should be kind. It's obvious that we should do the gifts of the Spirit that we have been uh, given on the day of our salvation of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We should be doing these things. But Paul goes on and, and he says, um, I charge you to keep these things. And then he says, without prejudging, doing nothing, from partiality. I, I, I think it, it should be stated that there is no room in the church for partiality, favoritism, prejudice. 
th there isn't. I, I when I was a, a new believer um, and uh, a new pastor, so I, I've been a, I, I started to become a pastor. So I was five years, six years into Christianity. I'm still a new guy. Um, and when I began to help formulate the teams that I would have a chance to work with, I put people on it that were like me. They were my friends, my favorites, the guys that I thought would would be, well, that they'd be on my team. After I went on in ministry for a bit, I began to recognize all I was getting was people who were telling me I was okay, that everything was fine. They were giving me and taking, here's my, I'd throw my ideas out there. And they'd say, that's a great idea, Pastor. And, and they'd go on with it. And I, I really got to the point that I'm like, I, I don't, I don't want my idea. I want your idea. And so I began to put people on our teams that were the opposite of me. I began to put people on, on the teams that, that were not my favorites. I wish I was a better student of the Word because I could have learned this a whole lot earlier, Darren. But I didn't. But Paul tells a young Timothy, don't do anything, anything with prejudging and partiality. It should be obvious that a spirit of favoritism and prejudice has no place in the church of Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting that, that this passage comes up in the climate of our country today. I, I grew up in a small town in, uh, in western Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm kind of old, and I remember one of the first kind of outings that I had with my grandmother was a trip down to downtown Sharon, Pennsylvania. We were going to the movie, and we, we took a cab from her home, and we went to downtown Sharon and first went into a place called the Sharon Store. I'd never been in it before. The Sharon Store was a five-story, like, department store kind of a thing. This would have been in the, uh, golly, very, very early 60s. Where the elevator was, I saw a water fountain. I ran to the water fountain to get a drink. My grandmother almost ripped my arm out of the socket, stopping me from going to the water fountain. And her words to me were, not that one. Do you know what she was talking about? The sign over that water fountain said, colored only. Why in the world were there two water fountains? It's because this scripture was not being followed in the little community that I grew up in. It's as simple as that. You know, friends, I, I, when I, I look at my sheltered life as I grew up and I I kind of recognize I have to begin to think differently. We, we can't continue on like this. It can't be. And so I, I, I look at this passage and I just leave it as it, it says to us that, that there is no room in the church of Jesus Christ for prejudice, favoritism, for, for, for doing things like it just can't have it. And that begins with us as a church. It begins with your church leaders. It begins with me as a denominational kind of guy. It begins with each one of us in our families. Teach it. Teach it from Scripture. And don't be afraid to say, I, I wasn't raised that way. I didn't know. My, my grandfather was horribly prejudiced. I didn't, I didn't know it at the time. But looking back on it, I think, Grandpa, Why? Why? And the excuse, just because I was raised that way, I don't buy it. And neither should you. We're the church of Jesus Christ, bought with a price. And it's not just for us. Just as there will not be some hill upon which we will put the Baptist flag and the Methodists will be on another and, and others and others and others, there will be no separation by colors or culture. 
things in heaven should be reflected. Isn't that right? So as Timothy uh, continues to take this information, um, Paul switches this, which I think is interesting because um, I I wonder if verse 22 happened and Paul is saying this because the guy, the elder that is being reprimanded that Paul is talking about, well, verse 22 says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. The, the, the laying out of hands is significant because it talks about uh, what we do as a church that gives official recognition of call of God on someone. And so and when I became pastor, there was a laying out of hands by that body of believers that said we acknowledge that, that we believe God has called you here and we acknowledge that and call you here also. And that same thing happened in every church that I pastored and, and even in the tasks that I do now with our state convention. And so this, this touching, uh, laying on of hands is very significant. But, but Paul says to Timothy, don't do it too quickly. Be, be very careful about how you do that. And, and, and then he, he says, um, don't be hasty of the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself Pure, and I want to. I want to start at the end of this because I hope you recognize that your pastors, your elders, and your leaders, their primary role is to keep themselves pure. And sometimes I think as churches we forget that the men we have called to serve are people. They need time in order to reflect. They need time in order to restore. They need opportunity to be able to keep themselves pure. See, as, as church folk, what, time, what we tend to think at times is that they exist to keep us pure. And so we want them to be able to pour out excellent messages. We want you to spend significant time in the Word to be able to tell us what we need to know. But when was the last time you went to your pastor and said, Pastor, how you're doing in your own in your own search for holiness and purity. Are you having enough time and resources to be able to do those things, Pastor? Because that's his primary role, for he cannot lead you anywhere that he is not willing to be. So so the first thing I think we should recognize, it's obvious that church leaders um, need to be able to uh, keep themselves pure. The the second part of that is I think it's obvious that the church leaders need to show their faith for a period of time before we put them in place. It's very simple. Um, I don't know what that period of time is. I think every church needs to determine what that is, but you don't want to bring someone that is brand new to the faith and all of a sudden make them an elder. That's that's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense in... uh, in a business setting, it makes no sense in a church setting, and, and Scripture tells us that. And, and, but then there, there, there's another piece in this, is it should be obvious that when church leaders appoint someone too hastily, that they share the responsibility for the ill results. I think that's what Paul is telling, telling Timothy. Don't be hasty in laying on hands, Timothy. Because if you do, you will take part in the sins of others. You'll be responsible for the things that they did wrong. And, and so be, take, take care with that, Timothy. In, in the 23rd verse, as we see, we see an ob- absolute switch. T- Paul is now going to switch from these, these large church matters to, Timothy, you're my son in the faith. Let's just talk for a second. And, and he says to Timothy in the 24th, 23rd verse, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The ESV uses parentheses around this that are obviously um, are not in the original language, but the intent is is for people that are reading this to be able to recognize that, that this is an aside. This is a comment just to Timothy. And I want to say to you that that needs to be obvious to us that this is, it, it is meant personally for Timothy, but I also want to say that, that it is obvious that it doesn't say alcohol should be part of the Christian life. No, no, look, I, I, I'm going to jump in and, and say this. and I'm. Um, it is not sinful to drink, but it is absolute sin to get drunk. The problem with us as human beings is we don't know where the line 
is drawn. I'm speaking to you as one who is alcoholic and know that you can start, but you can't stop. And here's the deal. If I could just say this. You have the freedom to drink as a, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You do. I do. I choose not to. Because I will not allow my freedoms to draw someone into a trap that they cannot get out of. And so here's the deal, Christian. If you're going to drink, do it alone. Don't encourage someone else. And don't post it on Facebook, for, for goodness sake, where everybody that you know, all the people that you work with, those very people that you're trying to witness to, they don't think you're special and cool because you put your picture up there next to a bottle of wine. Alcohol is a gateway drug. And if you don't think it is, I'm sorry, but you're missing the boat. You're being fooled. Don't let the enemy use you. Don't let it happen. Paul is saying to Timothy, use a little. Did you notice the word? You know why that's there? Because that's what Paul said. Use a little. Because something was wrong with Timothy. It was a medicinal purpose. The interesting part about this, I think, is that is that Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Now, Timothy, um, use a little for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. And then verse 24 says, The sins of some men are conspicuous. In other words, I think, train of thought wise, Paul is going to be careful, Timothy, because this stuff will grab you. It grabs people all the time. And so Paul writes... Let's look at the, the last two verses of this chapter. The sins of some men are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those who those that are not cannot remain hidden. There's two obvious things, I think, in that passage, and, and the first one is about good works I'd like to talk about. It should be obvious that the good works make themselves known. You don't have to toot your own horn. Do you ever notice people, and I, I see it in the, in the, in the news on, online and on Facebook especially, where, where someone will say, you know, uh, uh, I, you know I, just, I just fed a stranger. Do you don't have to tell people that. Good works can't be hidden. They're conspicuous. They come out. My, my grandfather said to me, don't toot your own horns. Don't toot your own horn. Let somebody else toot it for you. And I... That's not very scriptural, the way it sounds. But the idea is, is that if you're going to do something good, you don't need to proclaim it. Just do it. We're all called to, go, to do good works. Brother Pastor used the passage this morning when he opened up. That's why we were created. So I, I, I think it should be obvious that good works make themselves known. They, they just do. They can't be hidden. Flip side. Paul talks about that the sins of some men are conspicuous going before them to judgment. In other words, sin always makes itself known too. It can't be hidden. Either now or later it comes out. It, it, if you love someone, I'm talking about your children, friends that you have deep relationships with. Do you ever notice how they don't have to tell you that, there, that something has happened in their life and you know it? That it, they wear it? That, 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 that it's just, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it, it's it, in my life, uh, here, here I am, um, it, I, I'm, I'm 36 years old, I'm, I'm seeking to understand this weight that I feel in my life. And I mean, it was a heavy burden. I, I, the, the difference between me on Thursday night to Friday morning, on that day that I got saved Friday morning, would have been, it, it felt like 50 pounds taken off of my back, maybe more. I was a really good sinner. But that weight was stripped away from me, from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He took the weight. 
what are you what are you holding on to right now? What what sin is is struggling and stretching its way around your life that you are not confessing, that you are not putting up for the Lord? He, here's the thing. Your friends know you're struggling with it. Those that are really close to you know exactly what it is. And you deny it. You say it's not really bothering me. That's not your issue. That's somebody else's. I, I think it's obvious that sin's weight can never be completely hidden. It always makes itself known. I, I, in, in Romans, Paul writes to the Romans... And, and he says, for the wages of sin is death. Interesting, the, the word wages um, really is a word that talks about weight. Because do you know what people were paid that their wages came from? They were weighed out for them. The wages were weighed out. In fact, they talk about in Roman times that their soldiers were, were uh, partially uh, paid uh, in salt that would be weighed out for them to take home. And I, I, I see here that while, while the weight of sin can't be hidden, there is only one way to get the weight of sin off of my life. I can't unburden myself of it. I can't lift it off my shoulder like a backpack and set it aside. I must present it to the cross of Jesus Christ and there accept the work that He did on my behalf. To say, Jesus, You died for this that I wouldn't have to bear it. That I can walk through life unweighted and my wages are not death anymore because you died on my behalf. When Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, he, he finishes that verse uh, by saying, but the free gift of, of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I, I don't know where you sit, I don't know where you are if you're sitting at home, sitting on your couch. I don't, I don't know the circumstances of your life, but here's what I would understand. You will either bear the weight of your sin to your death, or you will let Jesus take it from you. For some of us as born-again believers, we, we did that. We, we gave everything we had, all the sin of our life, to Jesus on the day that we were saved. And we have not confessed our sins since then. As if we don't have to. Yeah, he, he did die for everything past, present, and future. But you're bearing the penalty of that sin right now. Some of you are living powerless lives in your Christian walk. Because sin is weighing you down. Unburden yourself this morning. Go to the cross. Trust the Christ who died for you. Take your sin. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would today be the day that you can change that? I say yes. The Bible reminds us that today is the day of salvation. I know that we don't have a, a personal time up front during this COVID-19 time, but there are two tables in our room. Um, There'll be somebody, one of our pastors will be back at the corner that's over your right-hand shoulder. Uh, I had the chance to help over here at this one. If you want to talk to somebody, we'd love to talk with you about how to walk closer to Christ or how to get saved. All of those things are available to you today because of what Jesus did for you so many years ago. Let's pray together, please. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, and I, I ask God that you would... Uh, uh, help us just to be honest and true to you in this whole thing. May, may we reflect you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Bob. We appreciate that good message this morning. And as he mentioned, he will be right down here after the service. If you'd like to talk with Bob, then feel free to make your way there or make your way to the back. You can also always respond with the Connect card that's in here. On the back, there are some places where you can write about the decision that you're making, we'll follow up with you on those. There's also the virtual Connect card. Uh, you can text the word CONNECT to 812-214-1987, and you can uh, let us know of decisions that you're making there. 
We do want to remind you of a couple of announcements very quickly uh, as uh, that are in your bulletin. One is the 55 Club Cookout is coming up on Saturday, July 18th. Uh, at noon here at the church, the church will be providing meat and drinks. We're asking people to bring desserts, uh, good desserts, and uh, side dishes. So uh, if you would bring those, and we uh, would appreciate that. If you're planning on attending, sign up on your Connect card so that we know how many to plan for. Our next Northwoods class is coming up on July 19th. It'll be right after the 1045 service, and uh, we would love for you to be a part of it. If you're not a member of this church yet, but you've become a part of our fellowship in, in recent months. We would love for you to be a part of that. You can sign up on your Connect card in the back. Just say, I'm coming to the Northwoods class. We'll sign you up. Make sure that you have free food, and that takes about an hour to work through the material. Also, we are still giving out lake permits. We've had some changes with our lake recently. If you are going to be out at the lake, we do ask you to get a lake permit. I do have some of those with me, and I can get those to you if you need one of those. But also, if friends are coming out to the lake, they'll need to have one, and they can pick it up in the office, and, uh, and we'll, we'll make sure that they have permission to be out there. Also, we have some uh, children's ministry news. We are planning on opening up our kids' ministry next Sunday. Uh, Pastor Matt is doing some uh, training re related to that to our leaders. If you are a children's ministry worker, there will be a uh, training available online. Uh, that you can watch. So uh, he will be sending out an email related to that um, to, to let you know about the new things that we'll be doing. Also, our family ministry will be having virtual VBS this year. Uh, that will be coming up uh, July 27th through the 31st. And they have some materials that they'll ask you to pick up and then you'll, you'll uh, log in. I, I don't really know. Uh, I'm assuming it, it'll be virtual. Uh, and, and you'll sign up at Northwoods Church uh, slash events. There's a place there where you can sign up, and they'll get you all the information that you need. Uh, we are going to be baptizing this morning, and so uh, Pastor Matt is going to be over into that. We'll also be baptizing in the second service as well. It's a good morning to have a baptism because this is a weekend when we celebrate freedom. And there's no greater freedom than the freedom that comes in Christ. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that you have been set free. And so we face a, a greater freedom through Christ than we could ever find here on earth. We have freedom from sin, freedom from death, and victory over all these things. And so as we do baptism this morning, we celebrate chains being broken uh, of enslavement to sin and coming up out of the water, it demonstrates that we are free and renewed in Christ. And so I'm going to ask Caroline to come in the pool with me. This is Caroline Burns. Caroline contacted me this week. She keeps, she said Caroline, and my southern roots keep saying Carolyn. So excuse me for that. But come on out. This is Caroline Burns. And uh, Caroline put her faith and trust in eighth grade a long time ago, and she's in a situation that a lot of adults are in, that uh, you get your uh, baptism before your salvation, and the correct order to do that is to get saved and then get baptized. And so Caroline called me, and she said, it's time, and it is a good time today to get baptized. So if you cross your arms, all right, and hold your nose, Caroline... Based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord, I now baptize you as my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Him in death, and you're risen to walk in newness of life. Before I go back, I just wanted to say one thing quickly about Family Ministry reopening next weekend. The main thing we're doing is temperature checking kids. And so, just when you come next weekend, allow some extra time, because if you're nursery all the way through high school or a volunteer for one of those things, we're going to temperature check you when you come in. Thank you, Matt. Well, that's our service this morning. We are going to be receiving an offering at the door. We have boxes by the doors, as uh, you may be aware of us if you've been coming. Uh, we ask you to put your Connect card. You can just fold it and put it down in there. And also, if you have an offering that you're giving this morning, you can drop that down inside of there. 
Uh, many of are doing online giving during this time. You can do that at northwoodschurch.org slash giving uh, and can give that way. That link will come up on the screen probably. And uh, also uh, you can text to give if you want to as well. That will be at Northwoods Church. Uh, you can text the word give to the word to 812-214-1987 and you can give that way uh, as well. We'd be glad for you to do that. Uh, that's our service for this morning. We want to remind you to use the designated desk exits, as if, if you will. Most people don't have a problem with it, uh, but there are some people that are sensitive and that are coming. They want to have kind of space, so we'll be kind to them. If you'll use the two exits and not go out the front exit, we would appreciate that. But if you would do it quickly as we have another service in just a few minutes, all right? So you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, all right? Let's stand together. We'll pray. Lord, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity to worship you, to hear from your word, to see one another. We pray that you would encourage us during this time. We thank you for this good word that we've heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. You're dismissed.